And good evening and welcome to today's 100 Days of Shakespeare contribution. Uh, it's day six. I just had a little mind mend then. little forgot what day it was. So it's day six of the 100 Days of Shakespeare. Uh, hope you have started uh, getting involved and uh, interested in what's going on. And uh, hope you get yourself in into uh, some of the stuff that's being shared within the 100 Days of Facebook group. So... Uh, just as a reminder for that, I will put the link to the Facebook group in the comments, uh, in the description below rather, and um, you can jump into there. It's a public group and you can have a look at the resources and the research that other people are doing and sharing within that group. Uh, you can share some of your own resource, resources and research that you might be doing, uh, but it is it is going to shape up to be quite an amazing resource on Shakespeare, his life, and his times. So I definitely encourage you to check that out and uh, also put your phone on silent when you uh, go and do a live stream because my daughter is sending me a photo. So, um, so tonight what I wanted to do is jump in and have a very quick look at the Master of Revels. Um, so uh, you may have heard of the Master of Revels. The Master of Revels was the person that controlled what could and could not be played within the playhouses within London and uh, pre predominantly within Shakespeare's period. So I'm just going to run through kind of five or six things that kind of mark the timeline for the Master of Revels and um, just kind of set the scene a little bit about what the power was and how it came to be um, at that time. So... The Master of Revels was actually answerable to the Lord Chamberlain. Now, you may have heard of the Lord Chamberlain's men. So Shakespeare and his company were the Lord Chamberlain's men, and they were um, appointed to that by the Lord Chamberlain. Now, the Master of Revels answered to the Lord Chamberlain. Now, the Lord Chamberlain was essentially the head of the household in, um, in the the king and queen's court, and they were predominantly responsible for organising all of the revels that happened at court, all of the court masks, M-A-S-Q-U-E-S. -E now, these were super elaborate entertainments that happened. I've seen an account of one where they literally filled one of the, the gardens with water and had miniature battleships floating in to actually stage this battle and this war. Um, as, as an entertainment for the royal court. So, um, you know, the kings and the queens, they didn't go out to see a show. The show came to them. So these are all entertainments that happened in the court. So um, the master of the revels, well, the revels office was set up to manage those revels and those masks. So within them, there was you know, someone responsible for maintaining the costumes and the wardrobes. And quite often they would create very elaborate sets and uh, set pieces and backdrops and this kind of thing. So, you know, very expensive. Um, at um, and, and so that's that's what the, the purpose of the office was. Now, as playgoing left the church and left uh, the church uh, buildings and became more of a public spectacle. And as it became more and more secular in its devices, um, people became more interested in seeing stories of, um, you know, sort of mystery, fantasy, entertainment, rather than uh, things with a moral uh, story to it, things with a moral a moral <laughs> things with a moral to them so um yeah less of the church-based stories and that kind of thing and so this is where play going really started to take on a, a life of its own across london particularly and so obviously that was then causing friction and that was obviously uh, causing the church a lot of dilemma and actually i don't I don't need to be wearing those because <laughs> I'm not listening to anything. I just had them on before. Um, and so, uh, you know, at this time we start to see the church trying to get some of these secular stories and the secular plays uh, banned and that sort of thing. And then eventually we see the playhouses move outside the city limits. Now, in 1578, Edward Tilney was appointed 
Master of the Revels. And the Revel's office at this point is said to have been in somewhat dire straits financially and had spent a lot of money and continued to spend a lot of money. And so he took on the mantle of reining that in and actually um, reducing the expenses of the office. And so uh, he was appointed the Master of the Revels. And I'm just going to read an excerpt of the appointment of him to the office. It's a little, it's a little bit lengthy, but it's fascinating to see and to hear the um, limitations and the powers that were set within this appointment. So let me just read this excerpt from the uh, edict, which was the appointment of Edward Tilney, uh, Edmund, sorry, Edmund Tilney to the Master of the Revels. So it says, we have and do by these presents authorize and command our said servant, Edmund Tilney, master of our said revels by himself or his sufficient deputy or deputies to warn, command and appoint in all places within this our realm of England, as well as within their franchises and liberties as without all and every player or players with their playmakers either belonging to any nobleman or otherwise bearing the name or names or using the faculty of playmakers or players of comedies, tragedies, interludes, or what other shows soever from time to time and at all times to appear before him with all such plays, tragedies, comedies, or shows as they shall have in readiness or mean to set forth and them to present and recite before our said servant or his sufficient deputy, whom we ordain, appoint and authorize by these presents of all such shows, plays, players, and playmakers, together with their playing places, to order and reform, authorize and put down, as shall be thought meet or unmeet, unto himself or his said deputy in that behalf. So... Wow, basically anyone that wanted to perform a play, create a play, put a play on, had to run it through Edmund Tilney or his appointed deputies in order to get approval. And it goes on to say, which, which this, is, this is quite incredible. And also likewise, we have by these presents authorized and commanded the said Edmund Tilney that in case if any of them whatsoever they be, will obstinately refuse upon warning unto them given by the said Edmund or his sufficient deputy to accomplish and obey our commandment in this behalf, then it shall be lawful to the said Edmund or his sufficient deputy to attach the party or parties so offending and him or them to commit toward to remain without bail or main prize until such time as the same Edmund Tilney or his sufficient deputy shall think the time of his or their imprisonment to be punishment sufficient for his or their said offences in that behalf. And that done to enlarge him or them so being imprisoned at their plain liberty without any loss, penalty, forfeiture or other danger in this behalf to be sustained or borne by the said Edmund Tilney, Edmund Tilney or his deputy, any act, statute, ordinance or provision hereto had or made to the contrary hereof in any wise notwithstanding. So this absolutely extended Tilney's powers from just the arrangement of royal entertainments into essentially being the control point for all play going, not just in London, but in this, our realm of England and its franchises. So wherever that reign extended, wherever they had control, this was to be done. And so that would mean, obviously, you know, in some of the outskirts and the outer lying areas, Tilney could appoint a sufficient deputy in order to oversee that. And for some time, actually, uh, a lot of the mayors of towns and other um, appointed officials within certain areas did that job. So upon pain of going to prison, you had to present your play to be signed off by the Master of Revels. 
So absolutely amazing. Now, in 1581... Uh, his powers were extended to also include the censorship of plays. So he was at that point able to um, basically say that cannot be performed. Now, there are some accounts that explain that once a play was signed by the Master of the Rebels, it could be reduced in size at the liberty of the playmaker but it could not be expanded. So you couldn't come up with another amazing line that you wanted to include and add it to the play. You couldn't change that text. You couldn't do it. But if you wanted to take some scenes out to make it shorter, so say, for instance, you had a four-hour version of Hamlet and you wanted to go somewhere and play a two-hour version, you could. And so what this meant was that the plays that were presented to the Master of Revels were often the full in-depth version of that play as it might be played at its full. So it gave the playing company the most amount of option and opportunity to pick and choose the scenes that they wanted to do. Some things might come out depending on what the current political situation was or the, the, the place where they were touring to it might not be something that would work there. And so it gave them the ability to reduce the size of the play down, but they could not add scenes. And so once it was signed off by the Master of Revels, that was it until it was represented and signed off again. So some really fascinating stuff there. Now, in 1598, um, the Queen's men had been um, playing for some time and, and it was essentially a monopoly that the Queen had kind of handpicked a bunch of players and put them together as the Queen's men. And uh, at, uh, at that point in 1598, an edict was set out that limited the London companies to two. And it was at that point the Master of Revels um, was actually uh, able to appoint uh, the two companies. And so he had a bit of control over that. Um, in the 1590s, the Master's players also then included the licensing of plays and that actually later extended into the licensing of plays for printing. And so they also had to be taken through the Master of Revels before they could be put to print and, um, and printed for people to purchase and take on. So um, quite a powerful position. There is some accounts that I've read that suggest that at one point the Revels office was actually making more money from bribes than it was through the um, purchasing of the Revels um, official. Yeah, basically, so every time one of these things became an official thing that needed to be done, just like we see today where, you know, you get charged for that service by a government department or, you know, maybe you go down to the Department of Transport to get your license renewed. You've got to get that. You have to pay for that again. Well, just like that, back here, all of these things that the, the Master of Revels was, was um, appointed to do came at a cost. And so that was a way for the Master of the Revels and the Office of the Revels to make money back. They would also hire out the sceneries that they had previously created for the masks and that sort of thing. So they had costumes and props and sceneries available for the playing companies to use. So all of these things helped raise money. But apparently, <laughs> so some accounts say, um, not anywhere near as much money as they made in bribes, um, ensuring that plays could be played. So um, one fun little um, uh, uh, account that I read actually um, kind of pointed the finger at the Master of Revels um, because there was a play being played while James I and his court were actually out of town and it was very heavily poking fun at the Spanish and uh, essentially it was running for nine days and the, and the playing company at the time uh, had been playing it back to back nonstop for nine days and the people were loving it. But uh, one of the Spanish royalty found out about it and put in a massive complaint and got the whole thing shut down. So, um, and apparently the master of the revels got off because he was sort of protected by the Lord Chamberlain. So um, not quite sure about the full details of that. I'm definitely going to dig into that a little bit more, but just a, a fun little story that I picked up during some research a little while ago. So, um, so look, there you go. Very, very brief, quick overview of the Master of the Revels. Um, definitely worth investigating more. Um, there are lots of civic records 
from the Office of the Revels that actually talk about the costumes and the properties and the maintenance of them. So you can get, if you can get your hands on any of the civic records from the Office of the Revels, you will get a really great understanding of the types of things that they made and had and and created for the masks and what they maintained over a period of time for the plays. Um, oh, the other thing that I should mention is that Tilney, in order to um, to save money, moved away from producing the masks, which were the really big elaborate shows, and focused more on producing plays. And so the 17, sorry, the 1573, 74 season, um, had three masks that he paid £75 for each. So £75 each for. And then uh, when he came in and started focusing on um, plays instead of the masks, so that was 1573 to 1574, we got three masks at £75 each, which of course, back then, a lot of money. Tilney is appointed in 1578, and then the 1578 and 1579 season were, uh, how many? Nine plays that cost £25 each. So he made that shift to going to plays, which didn't require the creation anywhere near as much of elaborate sets and properties. It was just actors and some costumes and not much in the way of set pieces. And that was a way that he was able to cut costs and still present lots of entertainment to the court, but do it in a way that saved them a lot of money. And that was really the first um, big turning point that he made in regards to saving the office of the revels a lot of money over a period of time. And then obviously as their uh, control extended, he was able to charge for those services and then apparently also take bribes. So, um, you know, got the office back up into quite a good financial position. So uh, he didn't hold it forever, of course, but uh, he was a main turning point in that office. So there you go. I hope that was uh, something of interest to you. Definitely, definitely suggest that you dig in a little bit more around the Office of the Revels and the Master of the Revels. Um, some really fascinating stuff when you start digging into the types of controls and uh, the, the things that they were doing and, and, you know, just the way that that whole office operated. So, um, thanks very much for checking this out. Uh, if you got anything out of this video, it would be great. If you gave it a like, please subscribe to the channel and follow us along our 100 days of Shakespeare. We're part of a wider event that is been created within the society for creative anachronism, uh, which is a worldwide medieval reenactment society. Uh, that I've been a part of for over 25 years. And um, yeah, I'll pop a link to the group in the description below and uh, a link to some websites actually that uh, have some great information about the Office of the Revels just as a starting point. And of course, I'll pop in there some books that I own that I've used as references for some of these bits of information. Uh, that's